Good to see everybody on this blustery Lord's Day morning. In just a moment, we're going to open up our New Testaments and begin in Revelation chapter 16. Before we begin, let's go to our Father in prayer. Almighty God, our Father, holy, holy, holy art Thou. We give thanks for this day, for Your love, the blessings that we know, especially those in Christ Jesus. We give thanks, Father, for Your demonstration of love, the willingness to provide a sacrifice that You would accept on behalf of all of us. We give thanks, Father, for the forgiveness of sins, the ability then to be recognized as your children. We pray with all of our hearts that we never lose sight of the true love that you've demonstrated towards us and live in thanksgiving all of our days to praise you with all of our heart and to dedicate ourselves purely to you to learning from the word that guides us, keeps us, and keeps us safe until such, such time as we're with you for eternity. We pray for the sick, that you touch them and heal them, those who can't be with us this morning, those who are providentially hindered because of age and illness. We ask that you be with them and be merciful to them. Help us, their brethren, to be mindful of them also to share in their afflictions, to be there for them. We give thanks, Father, as we recognize your blessings and answered prayers for those who have returned back to us who have been ill, and we're thankful once again. We pray, Father, that as we have privilege this morning to open your word, that we prepare our minds to learn and help us to recognize the forces of evil that are gathered against us that want us to fail. But instead, Father, let us dwell on the things that you have provided to strengthen us, keep us, and give us the power to overcome, knowing that you have already won the great victory. Let us align ourselves with you. We pray, Father, that we encourage each other in this great fight that we're in for the souls that you want. And we know, Father, that you love us all and want us all. Let us battle together. Let us lock arms together and overcome. This is our prayer in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our King. Amen. Let's open up to Revelation chapter 16. We're going to take a look at verses 12 through 16 this morning. We left off here last week. It was kind of an opportune place for John to finish off this last week, and we're going to stop and take a look at some of the things that are here that are kind of an important lesson for us. I'm going to share some information and build up towards um, a point, but at the end of the point, I want to make sure that we have opportunity to talk about uh, some very important things that this passage should help all of us to look at. So if you would, let's open up and let's read this passage once again. Uh, we're going to read down verses 12 through 16. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, 
lest he walk naked, they see his shame, and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called, in, called, I'm sorry, in Hebrew, Armageddon. Now, as we take a look at this, there's some really important things here that we want to stop and take a look at. And I don't know if we've paid attention, but as we've gone through the look here, the heavenly view through the bowls and each of the representation of the bowls that we've come to, coming to the sixth one, I don't know if you've paid attention to the similarities from the heavenly view that was earlier shared from chapters 8 through 11 with the trumpets. And it's unique that even uh, in the sixth trumpet that this uh, sixth bowl parallels with from the heavenly view, uh, there's even the beginning and the opening message that is absolutely identical to this as the origin of the forces uh, being shared coming from the great Euphrates. Now, if you have any history with the children of Israel, we know that historically, uh, many times the land that God gave the children of Israel uh, was the subject of raids from the uh, Tigris River, Euphrates River uh, basin. Uh, and many of the forces that would come from over there would come in and they would raid. They were always uh, considered to be evil in terms of what damage and pain and horrible things they would inflict on the land when they would come over and they would raid. Uh, going back as early as Lot, if you remember Lot, it was the kings from that very uh, river basin that we're mentioning here that came over, that did so much damage, and then took, of course, Lot prisoner that Abraham and his uh, servants went after and brought Lot back and the treasures and all the things that they had taken. Uh, but as early as that and then many, many more times, so symbolically to the people that this was written to, they understood the nature of forces coming from this area. Uh, but if you look over real quick to chapter 9 of Revelation, as I mentioned, it, it shares some similarities with the, um, the sixth trumpet that's mentioned here earlier on. Uh, from the heavenly view. Now remember that in the book of Revelation, uh, up to the 11th chapter, we have uh, from chapter uh, 6 through 11, we have the heavenly view uh, as we start in chapter 12 with the great victorious scene of, of, the, of God winning the ultimate battle through Christ Jesus. Uh, from there to chapter 19, you're going to have the earthly view. Uh, both chapter 11 and chapter 19 have the exact same summary, and that is the summary of the ultimate victory of God and Christ Jesus and His kingdom. And that's the kingdom we're privileged to be part of to this very day. But here in the sixth trumpet, uh, as the same forces, and just real quick, even before I get um, oh, to that sixth trumpet, look at verse 13 before I read verse 20. It says, uh, verse 13, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the, from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And once again, we have the exact same origin uh, as the sixth bowl of these forces that are being released to come. But it's in verse 20 and 21 that I want us to stop and take a look at because I want to make sure that we define uh, the characteristics of these forces. And we're going to come back to our own uh, sixth bowl here in a minute. We're going to tie all these together. But it says in verse 20, And the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see, uh, nor hear, nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor their sorceries, nor their sexual immorality, nor their thefts. And I wanted you to kind of take a look at the character of the forces that are being assembled uh, here, and that are going to actually come together uh, when we get down to it at Megiddo. Uh, and be ready then to do battle against God. Now, 
With that said, let's go back and take a look at our sixth bowl. And we see that here in verse um, 13 that we have these forces coming out first of the mouth of the dragon. Who does the dragon represent? Say it louder. Satan. Okay. So we know ultimately these are the forces of evil. Yes? Because of the origin of where these forces are coming. But then it mentions out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the prophet. Okay? And it doesn't say prophets with an S. It says the prophet. This prophet specifically tied to the beast. And then both doing the will of whom? Satan. Right? So these forces are evil. Uh, we have the mouth of the beast. The mouth of the beast, uh, as we have come through and we recognize so far, uh, has been tied to our story in God's usage of the empire of Rome uh, and the representation that often is associated with Rome with emperor worship. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the mention of the great uh, battle that goes on between who should wear the mark of the beast and who should have the mark of God. Uh, and this is also going to be symbolic of the forces that we're talking about being mentioned here. But ultimately, the forces of evil here represent all the paganism that was associated around God's people that wanted to see them fail in every way, shape, and form. And I don't want us to lose sight of that because we're going to talk about this, particularly for you and I. Because this is where I want to draw us to. I want to draw us to the lesson that's pertinent for us. So we're going to come to that here in just a minute. But I want you to focus on the true origin of these, of these forces and what they represent and how similar it is to what you and I face in the world around us today. And how much they want us to fail as well. Who would be distressed by this? This, this imagery of the sixth bull and this awful thing being shared of these forces assembling uh, with, with great power on their side, if you will. They've mustered quite, a, quite an army together. Who would be distressed by this? Now remember, this is written to the seven churches of Asia. But primarily the seven represents the whole of God's people. Would they not be distressed in this? Yeah, you bet they would be. Uh, not only... Not only would they be distressed to know that this, this evil was going to be something that would have direct effect on them, but what about the damage that they were going to be allowed to inflict on where the battle is actually going to be fought? I don't know if you paid attention to this, but I'm going to cheat a little bit and, and share. If you'll notice that Megiddo is where the forces are going to gather, but that's not where the battle is going to be fought. This is simply where they've gathered together to come together to strengthen their power against God's people. It's in the next segment down that John's going to talk about next week. We're going to see where the battle is actually going to be fought. And we're going to talk about their inflicting their damage against Babylon. A term that's already been introduced to us from the heavenly view. Uh, the same city as we're going to come to find out where uh, God's Christ was crucified. Now, with all that said, the battle's going to be fought over that, and the damage is going to be inflicted on them. But how many of the, the Christians of the seven churches of Asia have fled Judea to go to Asia Minor at the warning of the apostles, to know that their own homeland is now going to be laid waste, and that God is going to send and use uh, this evil for his purposes to punish, but yet what do we know from Daniel uh, and Job uh, and Noah? Ezekiel writes that uh, whether Job or whether Daniel or whether Noah is in the land, righteous men, the righteous suffer right along with the unrighteous, don't they? There would be great pressure brought on these Christians to understand that they're, they're where they used to live and all the people they used to know, their neighbors, their friends, and maybe even some family members who have not obeyed the gospel, still in that great city when these afflictions begin, uh, are going to have all this brought to bear. Not to mention the troublesome times that we know are going to come from Christians at the beginning of this event as well. How are Christians going to be treated from the beginning of these events all the way through uh, 
through Domitian and uh, many of the other emperors that we know that brought great pain to bear to these Christians, this warning and this warning of these forces is sharing with them that there is going to be troublesome times. And I don't mean little, I'm talking harsh, troublesome times that they had better prepare themselves for in the understandings that were about to be given. Now remember, Christ himself is going to speak into this. And he's going to say, behold, I am coming. And then he gives some instruction to the Christians. And that's going to be the importance of this lesson. Now, real quick, just for the sake of uh, kind of putting in our mind uh, some of the information that's shared here. Uh, in verse 16, you have the mention of Armageddon. Uh, Armageddon is the complete uh, Greek transliteration of Megiddo or the Mount of Megiddo, as some of your notations might read. Um, Megiddo is also known as language developed and as time went as Megadon, then of course Armageddon in the Greek. But if you'll see where Megiddo is on the map, almost dead center, you see there's kind of a mountain that juts out towards the ocean there. Megiddo sits at the base of that mountain and covers uh, the pass from the Sharon uh, Plain over into uh, the, the Valley of Jezreel. And then, of course, over on the eastern side of Jezreel is Estralon. Uh, Estralon, just for you, know, for you to understand in the kind of the geography of the land, when Jesus taught in the parable of the sowers, and he mentioned that where the seed would fall on good soil, some would produce a hundredfold, some 60, some 40, well, Estralon was a place that the children of Israel actually could formulate in their mind where a hundredfold of the crops that they would plant would literally produce. It was the most fertile soil uh, of anywhere in this entire land that God had given his people. So when they thought of a hundredfold, their mind went right to Estralon. Whoever owned that land and farmed that land could expect a hundredfold. Uh, what a beautiful thought that that's the best of the best and of course, those who cherish the Word of God can understand that it will produce in their lives uh, truly capable of giving them the best of the best for their life, trusting in the Word of God. Uh, and of course, the more effort you put into it or the effort that you do invest in it produces equally. But one real quick, one more thing to share. This is kind of a contoured look. And if you look, I'm looking straight east maybe a little southeast, from the ocean into the Jezreel Valley, and you see Megiddo uh, sitting at the bottom of the mountain there. The plain of Sharon, you see where it says Israel. If you go south from there, that's the plain of Sharon running right down the coastline. Now, if you're traveling, just imagine how many times did the children of Israel have to go from the northern parts, uh, from Galilee, down to Jerusalem, Three times a year they had to, right? Uh, we know they went for Passover, for Pentecost, and then they came back in the fall for the Feast of Booths. Now, if you actually look at this map, if you're traveling from Capernaum down to Jerusalem, are you going to walk through them mountains? No. Common, common travel would be to come down on the mountain, cross the Jezreel Valley, go through the pass at Megiddo, go down the plain of Sharon, and then you have a gradual climb up to the city of Jerusalem from there. And that was the common pathway. And it would take you in the lower hill country right through Samaria every time you went through there. How often did Jesus go through Samaria in this part of the land? But I share all this because if you, if you just take a look at this strategically in your mind and you think about the forces that would gather on one side of this and the forces that might gather on the other side of this, in your Old Testaments, there were many battles that took place right there in this valley with just the forces on one side, on the, on the hills on this side, and the forces on this side, and they would come down and they would fight where? Right in the middle, right in the bottom of this valley. This place in the mind of the people that this was written to was a clear understanding that it was a common place for forces to gather to prepare to battle to inflict great damage on the land, uh, oftentimes, uh, and even in, 
up until the destruction of Jerusalem, which is just a beginning, by the way, all the way through the eradication of Israel from the land into the second century, all of the forces of Rome would come and they would, guess what, strategically locate before they would move on in these same places for the same reasons geographically. It made sense as we go. But, as I mentioned, in Armageddon is mentioned here, but that Valley of Jezreel, and all, I'm not going to read all these passages, but just also to keep in mind that all the battles that were fought strategically in that plain, very few of these battles actually went in Israel's favor, just so you know. So it also brought to mind that oftentimes these forces gathered against them could and had the power to oftentimes be victorious if if they didn't trust in who? In God. Good, in God. Uh, and that town of Megiddo, that, that fortress or village that was kind of acted like a fortress, that guarded that pass between these two points where the gathering often took place and then where the forces would then begin to march south. But here's some things that I want to stop and take a look at. Now, as we read this list, it is important for the sake of understanding in the book of Revelation that this was being shared to the Christians 2,000 years ago for them to comprehend in their mind uh, that they were about to see this great power wrought uh, against uh, the enemies of God or God to, to enact his judgments. Uh, but it was going to affect them all. But as we take a look at these forces and the character of these forces, I want us to think in our minds, and I want to spend a few minutes here and talk about this, how these forces today are still here and how they're bringing their power to bear against us. And this is where when I get to the last slide and I talk about what the Lord states to us in verse 15 uh, and gives to us, how important it is we pay attention to it so that we can learn to be overcomers today. Now remember when we were in the seven churches of Asia and the mention of the angels of Christ to each of the seven churches, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, but in, also in each one, he that overcomes. There was a universal thought process there, right? Because if we can't overcome these forces, what's our hope? Yeah. Now you start to see why this becomes important. The message that was to them for the specificity given here, vital, but yet to you and I, it's still a vital lesson, isn't it? So I wanted to stop here, and I hope you, you don't mind that we stop and take a look at some of this and, and really put it, put it to our feet so we can stand firm because of the likeness of the things that we have to deal with this very day. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, these forces are of Satan, ultimately. Uh, they're manifest in the beast, and the beast's prophet. Uh, was there a message against the people of God 2,000 years ago that was being promoted by Rome? What was, what was it to wear the mark of the beast? What was, what was all the emperors? Uh, some of them dabbled in it. Nero went full on with it. It would, it would continue in many of the others. Um, all of them would play in emperor worship, wouldn't they? And they wouldn't just play at it, they would demand it. So much so that if you wanted to do business in the Roman Empire, if you didn't proclaim that Caesar was a little g-god, oftentimes you would not be allowed to do business. You would be secluded, maybe even harmed, maybe even imprisoned, maybe even killed if you didn't acknowledge us. That's why there's so much information, so much talk about the mark uh, that we should want to wear. So real quick, go to Revelation um, chapter 13. <clears throat> and I, don't, I know I don't have 13 on the screen, but I want to talk about this mark real quick. Revelation chapter 13, look at verse 4. Now we've already covered this, but I want to remind us because of how much information is shared concerning this mark. Chapter 13, we have the beast from the sea. Verse 4 says, And they worship the dragon, 
who gave authority to the beast. Now remember, who's the dragon? Okay, you, do you really think they went out and they just opened up uh, uh, an altar and created all this symbolism and they actually openly worship Satan? What's he talking about by worshiping Satan here? What are we taught in Romans chapter 6? That if we don't, we don't serve God, by nature we're serving who? You're going to serve a master. You better learn to choose the right one, right? All right. So it says, uh, who gave authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and authority was given to him to continue 42 months, that, that same three and a half that we've talked about so many times, showing uh, an incomplete amount of time. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Did you hear that part? How were they blaspheming God and his people and his house? To speak, blasphemy means to speak evil against, right? To speak evil against. Is this, is this not the beginning? Uh, where, does, where does all evil originate from us? In our hearts, right? Their hearts were against. That means everything that they do, all their actions are also going to be against. We don't have that today, do we? Everybody loves us. Everybody thinks that we're just... Oh, there's some amazing folks because we're dedicated to God, right? You don't have any problems, do you? Come on. You see, you see where the problem is? And where are the hearts of those on the outside? By nature, we, we represent to them a strike against their conscience, don't we? We represent to them an understanding that they are in wrong based on a relationship with God. And to that, they have wonderful words for us, don't they? I wish Nola was here. She was given one of them uh, this last week. Uh, made fun of because of her love for God's word and her, her uh, lack of willingness to, to vary from it in any way, shape, or form. We, we, we receive that mockery often, don't we? Because we violate their conscience. And it's not us, just so you know, by the way. It's not us. It's simply our refusal to not love God for all he's done for us. And to love God means that we act in his best interest. To act in God's best interest means that we do what he says, the way he says it, with excitement. Because he says it. And because he gave it to us for our own best interest. It goes on. Verse 7 of chapter 13 says, And it was granted to him to make war with the saints. And to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. All these to make war against God's people. Where were their names not written? In the Lamb's Book. Uh, also referred to the Lamb's Book of Life in the book of Revelation. It's not written there. But yet, chapter 14 and verse 1. Look at, look at what we should want. Verse 14, or chapter 14, verse 1 says, And I looked, and behold, a Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his Father's name written where? on their foreheads. Swift identification, right? Identification that we belong to God. In this case, through Christ Jesus. And the 144 represents the entire total embodiment of all who would come to God through Christ Jesus. What a beautiful thought process, right? And then we know that Revelation shares specifically to us that the victory over evil over Satan in particular has already gone to Christ. Already means that battle's already fought. He's already won. What foolishness would it be for us? What foolishness would it be for us to side with the losing side intentionally? 
especially those of us who know better. What foolishness. But yet, in all of our lives, no matter our maturity level in Christ Jesus, how many gray areas do we still allow to, to affect us in our lives? How many back doors do we leave open for our adversary? How many things do we dismiss willingly, not understanding the power can be brought to bear against us and the danger ultimately of what it can cost us in this great battle. Remember, if the victory is already won and you allow yourself to be detoured from the winning side in any way, shape, or form, and your name is not written where it needs to be written, the seriousness of that should sober everybody up down to their toes. And if it doesn't, there's a problem in our minds with numbness. Numbness to the spirituality that we're supposed to be living in Christ Jesus. Numb to the faith and the strength that faith gives us to overcome. Numb to the tools that God gave us. Our warfare, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, our warfare is not physical. We don't wield uh, M16s and grenade launchers, but where weapons are powerful, he says, for overcoming all the things that can be brought against us. And Ephesians chapter 6 demands to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might because He has given us the entire panoply that we need to overcome, all the armor to overcome. Now, if He's given you all the tools, Peter says, all things that pertain to life and godliness, if He's given you all the tools, if the victory is already won, and if you need all of these things to be able to be victorious, what should be number one? What should be number one? Now, although that should make perfect common sense, these forces want to numb you to that, don't they? They want to numb you to it. So with that, let's go to, um, we talked about chapter 9 and verse 20. Um, I want to share a little bit about the, the list of the characteristics. Um, as we shared in chapter 9, they... These forces are made up of those who are unrepentant. Now, what has God commanded for all men to do? Acts chapter 17, 2 Peter 3, God wants all men to repent, yes? What does repent embody? Now, everybody's going to say it means to turn and, and go a different direction. All that is true. But what it really means is you have to learn to serve something New, and I mean serve it. I'm, what's the titles that we're given as children of God in Christ Jesus? Christian, I-A-N, we pertain to who? To Christ, we pertain to Christ. Meaning, as Christ is, so are we, right? Are we not also servants? Apostles of Jesus Christ, in, in virtually all their letters, Peter, Paul, it doesn't matter which one, they reference themselves as servants or bond servants of Jesus Christ. Why? Because they repented in their life and they come to serve something new, something greater than themselves. Where is self in repentance? Not my will, but thine be done. These are unrepentant, which means they're serving who primarily? Themselves. When we serve ourselves. You need to get this, we need to really implant this. When it has to be my way, I am automatically going right back to number one. By nature. You see how it works? When it's all about me, how am I God-like? Now remember, God served us, did he not? God and all of his power of creation, all the glory that can be mustered Throughout Scripture, revealing his character, his nature, his strength, all the things he was capable of doing that we can't even oftentimes fathom, yet he served us to become for us an example of what it takes to be those who overcome in this life, us. 
which means where do I always need to be in order to be victorious in this? Not my will, thine be done. Any time, well, I don't think, you hear it? I don't think, think, I want, I feel, I need. I become unrepentant in those moments by nature because I'm serving who still? Me. Me. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. The first two verses of Romans chapter 12 demand that we become holy sacrifices unto God, which is our reasonable service. We do this by conforming our mind and transforming it from this world to God's perfect will. Okay? But verse 3 says, this is the beginning of how you do this. You have to think less of yourself. <laughs> what, an, what an amazing prospect of bright, right at the beginning of learning how to do these things and to accomplish it is to think less of yourself. By the way, how many of you appreciate in Ephesians chapter 4 that we're to be angry and sin not? I think about this a lot because she's sitting right there to testify. I can get agitated sometimes and be angry, right? Be angry and sin not. Do you know the key to understanding that 90% of our anger comes from us feeling personally slighted? If we think less of ourselves, guess what goes away? The anger. Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing tool. It makes a great lesson, by the way, for learning how to overcome anger. At all this, though, once again, the power of understanding to be less is the power to understand how to be the best servant. And the best servant is tied in strength to who? To God and the victorious forces. Okay? We have to understand and appreciate this. So, they worship demons and idols. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. What did Paul demand of the church in Colossae do? He said to recognize these behaviors in your life, and he said, put them to death. And one of the last ones he mentioned was covetousness, which he said was idolatry. What's covetousness? I want. I want. And he said, put it to death. Now, we may not carve little doohickeys anymore and throw them down and worship them. And we worship them because it told us what we want because we asked, it, we asked what we wanted. But in all those things, we may not do that anymore. But there are many things out there that oftentimes have power over us because we want them. These forces represent that. And they re represent the temptation that comes along with it. James says, happy is the man who overcomes what? Temptation. Means, by the way, you can overcome it. Happy are you if you do it. Well, how do you do it without God's strength? I hate that dumbbell. Anyways, you start to understand the power being brought against us, right? All right, let's quickly talk about some of the things that we're given as tools to overcome. Be watchful. How many times does this repeat itself in Scripture to you and I? To be watchful. Now, here's something I'm going I'm to maybe open your eyes to just a little bit. Along with the teaching, to be watchful, that repeats itself over and over and over again in your Scripture, also coincides with the repetitive message that says, do not be deceived. That means sometimes you see things and you recognize it coming, but you deceive yourself into accepting it okay. So this idea of being watchful is not just that you see problems, but it demands, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, demands that we test all things. Test all things. Keep what is good, Abstain from what is evil. It demands that we make judgments. We must educate our understanding so that we make the proper judgments in what we see coming. Now, we're to be watchmen, literally. And I love in Zonderman's description here of, of the word as it's rendered to us in Scripture. It says we have the duty, and I underline this. It's our duty to be watchmen in our lives in particular. 
on behalf of our brethren, on behalf of the body of Christ here, to be watchmen, but especially in the unsuspecting times. And the unsuspecting times are often even when we see the problem. But we are not ready in our hearts to deal with it correctly. That's why the Word of God training you in your life is so important. It's not enough just to recognize, you might even see a problem coming, but to know exactly what God has given you to do in those moments to be victorious. So in uh, Acts chapter 20, to the elders of the church at Ephesus, that he, Paul is called to come to Miletus to meet with him there. In verse 28, he told them to shepherd the flock. The Holy Spirit had made them overseers, but he started this by saying, first look to yourselves. And then he warned them. The savage wolves were going to come in. And then he did this, even from among you. He pointed his finger right at those elders and said, even from among you. So he said, because of this, he told them to be watchful. Watchful. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Real quick to share this one, and we'll try to finish with keeping your garments if they don't ring it too fast. Were the Corinthian brethren, were they doing everything just wonderfully? No, this whole letter stands as a testament to the fact that the Spirit brought great discipline to bear on this body of Christ in this first letter of Paul to them. And in this great discipline, they were correcting virtually every problem a body of Christ could know. And at the end of this, after he gives them such stern and harsh words, he says this, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. What powerful words. Simple words, but yet they have so much meaning in what we're talking about in this great conflict, don't they? Be brave and be strong. Because it's in being brave and in the strength that God gives you that we're able to overcome what we might be passive about and literally say no. To, to create the proper and strong barrier that the tools of God give us to be victorious in this life. To things that have the power over us. Uh, there's some other passages there. Of course, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 screams because we have a powerful adversary. We must be watchful. Watchful, but also ready to make the right decisions. But then he says this. Keep your garments. Turn over to James chapter 1 real quick. James says it in some language. The very first uh, and probably earliest letter to the Christians these Christians were scattered. On Wednesday nights, we'll talk about this when we get into chapter 11. But as these Christians are scattered and going out, he talks about pure religion. Let me just read it real quick and we'll dismiss. Pure and undefiled religion. I know he didn't say religion was bad, did he? What did he say? Pure and undefiled religion before God uh, and the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their trouble, to be concerned about those who are in need, and to keep oneself, what? Unspotted from the world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Keep yourself unspotted. Keep your garments. That's the decision-making promise. Thank you.